Oh yeah! Welcome back, everybody, to another Drafts with Jordan and Josh. I am one of your co-hosts at PFF underscore Jordan, Mr. Jordan Plocker. And I want to welcome back uh, my beautiful co-host, Mr. Josh Liskowitz at PFF underscore Josh. Welcome back, buddy. Good, to, Glad you're here. Glad to be back. Glad to be talking some football. Instead of uh, talking Disney, how, how was your how was your trip? You know, Disney was good, man. It was uh, first time with the kid. Have two and a half year old was a little worried about that, but uh, he loved it, and it was and it was fun watching it through his eyes. So it was a good time. But glad to be back and on the grind. And um, you know, just to, you know, for you know, to give our listeners a review, uh, what about? I, I know that you were ranting and raving about the Pandora experience thing there. So what was the deal there with the Pandora? Oh, uh, man. I, I gotta tell you, it was better than Cats, the musical. <laughs> I would see it again and again and again. So he, here's how much I liked it. The last night, everyone else is cashed out. We've been there for seven full days. And I'm going back to Animal Kingdom at 10 o'clock at night, waiting two hours in line to ride the <laughs> Flight of Passage Simulator. I liked it that much. So <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you have a figured, problem. I figured we, we spent a good bit of money on this trip. Um, it's open to 1 a.m. because the park's brand new and there's a lot of people and the lines are long, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. And I thought, I'm getting my money's worth. I'm going one last time. And it was worth every painful minute of waiting in line again. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm glad you found uh, you know, the one thing there that you really like and that you have uh, you know problems you know not abusing. Uh, also glad that you made it back safely. Uh, you know because Disney can be a dangerous place going there with family. You know like you could lose your sanity easily. Um, so I'm glad that you're back uh, and, and you appear to be in one piece. So and, and we're gonna we're gonna keep talking. Um, about the 2018 draft and the draft prospects. But first, Josh, I want to get into, again, you know, a lot of these cool, exciting things that we have happening at the website. We have you know, the subscription packages, two different subscription packages, which you can find at profootballfocus.com backslash subscriptions. We have PFF Edge and PFF Elite. And again, PFF Edge unlocks all the premium articles across fantasy, DFS, uh, and NFL draft. It includes player grades, snap counts, blocking and career grades, all sorts of expert fantasy rankings, as well as all of Josh and my uh, and Steve Palazzolo's scouting work going into the NFL Draft Pass. So uh, we have all of that in Edge. And then, Josh, we also have PFF Elite. Why don't you tell us about Elite? Yeah, Elite, first off, you get the 2016 signature stats. Uh, you get 2017 Elite stats, signature stats, all that good stuff being unveiled next month. You get the DFS optimizer, so you can practice mock drafts for your fantasy league. That is a huge, huge bonus. Uh, you get a player position tool as well, and you get a whole bunch of other good stuff. And the other cool thing is we're still having our contest to win yeah. PFF Elite, to win a subscription to it. All you have to do is go on iTunes, uh, leave us leave us a note, leave us a review, give us five stars, please. That's a big help to us. But let, let us know what you think. And uh, as always, we'll pick a winner this week, and you could win yourself a full-year subscription to PFF Elite worth $200. Awesome deal. That is an awesome deal. So, yeah, definitely please go and leave us that five-star review. Uh, leave us a six-star review if you can figure out how to do it. If you can't, yes. leave a five-star review. Uh, again, those, those really help uh, you know, people find uh, the show and help us continue to create this show and give you guys all this wonderful PFF content. So, yes, please go leave a review there. All right, Josh, and then, uh, yes, we're going to get into – we've been talking about quarterbacks you know, for the duration of this show so far – uh, you know, we went over the top eight basically, and then when you were gone, just riding Pandora's rides on a loop. Uh, I was talking to Zach Robinson. Uh, we went over all those quarterbacks again. Don't listen to that episode, Josh. We talked a whole bunch of crap about you because you weren't here. And then um, now we're moving on from the quarterbacks to the guys who get after the quarterback. We're going to talk about the edge rushers and some of the top edge rushers for the 2018 class. Pretty excited about that. 
Again, when we talk the same thing about the quarterbacks, we'll say the same thing about these edge rushers. These guys have a whole season to change, you know, these narratives to improve on things that we're, you know, you know, picking on them about and things like that. So again, this is a whole year. These are you know, some of these are projections. There's so many moving pieces and parts. But again, we really wanted to just sort of like hit on some of these top guys uh, for you, the listeners, so you guys have a good idea of who to keep an eye on this year. Uh, you know, so. Starting right off the bat, Josh, who's the one guy that really stands out to you the most, you know, as far as pure edge ability? Yeah, that has to be Boston College's Harold Landry. Uh, just in, in terms of production, his PRP of 17.5, that was tops among returning edge players this year. Uh, it also had the most returning total pressures, 18 sacks last year, so That's he's ridiculous. not just a pressure guy. He's a guy that finishes on a consistent basis. Uh, is I think he's got a strong lower body build, so he can add weight to his frame. He's uh, what do you measure? Six hundred two, one two fifty. Yeah. So he's got a little bit of work to do there, but I think he has the frame to fill out. Explosive first step can plays extremely low, which helps him bend the edge. Uh, can use his physicality against blockers, uh, keep them from locking onto him uh, when rushing off the edge. And he does, he's starting to flash some inside counter moves, likes to rely on that speed rush because it works so well in college, especially his conference. But uh, he's a guy that really exploded in terms of production last year, and I think we're going to continue to see that upward trend with his production. Yeah, I mean, his production went from five sacks, 10 hits, and 24 hurries in 2015, all the way up to, like you said, 18 sacks, which is ridiculous, seven hits and 44 hurries last year. So one of the better, more talented, uh, as far as technique-wise, pass rushers in this class. And, you know, when we watched a bunch of these guys, you know, we'll get to the next guy down the list, but it kind of reminded me of... This past draft class when we had, you know, Miles Garrett at the top, who was freaky long and freaky athletic. And then you had Derek Barnett, who was also up there with him, who wasn't as athletic as a Garrett, but who was more technically sound and more productive in college. And that's kind of how we have these sort of top guys this year with Landry sort of being the Barnett, more technically sound guy, a guy who can really get to the quarterback in a lot of different ways. And then, you know, the other guy that we need to, to talk about at the top of the group with Landry is Arden Key from LSU, you know, a guy who, since he was been a freshman, has just been a, sort of a nightmare to block. But again, he's taller and longer than Landry. I mean, his, he's got really long arms. He's tall. He's six foot five. He's 240 pounds. You know, explosive edge speed can really turn the corner with ease. You know, it's, you know, he still seems a, a, a little bit loose sometimes when he's turning that corner, seems to flail his arms a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, and, and probably needs to add a little bit of bulk, but so, so long and so explosive. You know, what did you like about Arden Key? Yeah, I, you look at him on the hoof moving, and and he has all those athletic traits that you want. And the length is huge too. I don't think he really knows how to use it right now. He really needs to improve his hand usage, and I think that'll come with time. Uh, as, as you said, they all have a year to develop. These guys we're talking about, so. Hopefully we see some of that with Key. Now, he does come with a caveat this year. He uh, took some time away from the team. He's supposed to be back for the fall, so he's not going to miss any game time. But he did miss all of spring. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan. Yeah, it was kind of strange. Like Some people didn't know if he was going to be coming back, and I think he announced he's coming back. But yeah, yeah, it's kind of an odd offseason for him. Yeah, so obviously teams are going to be looking into that heavily, getting to the bottom of what exactly happened with that. In terms of his development, though, when you have a guy like him that really needs to improve things like hand usage and, and just the different technical aspects of the game, that's valuable lost time for him. Yeah. So I want to see if he's able to improve that in the month of August. Presumably he's going to be there in uh, summer camp right before the season starts. Let's see if he can make that progression there or if he's at a similar level to where he was last year. That's really going to put him a little bit behind where we want him to be at this point. Yeah, and, and, and the reason why that's a concern is because to this point he's almost been exclusively just a, an outside speed rusher, you know, just yep. really heavily relying on on his get off and his length and his, you know, burst there. But like, again, he needs to, the thing that we would like to see from him this year, you know, would be to sort of learn some more pass rush moves because he doesn't have the same arsenal as Landry. 
we really like to see him, you know, focus on an inside counter. Uh, he does have a nice spin, but with that athleticism, you know, you'd like to see a, a better, you know, quick inside rush. Uh, you know, he did have, you know, 12 sacks, 13 hits, and 29 hurries this past year, so really productive, you know, from the pass rush standpoint. Uh, but again, uh, you know, you hit the nail on the head there, Josh. You're a little concerned about him missing these time, you know, all that all those practices where he could have been, you know, working on his craft. So, you know, just, again, a concern, but a very, very, very productive player. All right, moving on, we're going to go on to the next player is uh, from Oklahoma is Obanaya Okoronkwo. And hopefully I pronounced that right. That's probably uh, close enough. That's yeah, not bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> what, what do you, what, tell us a little bit about, about Okoronkwo, Josh. Yep, uh, he has some upper body thickness, but his general size and and I don't have his numbers right in front of me. You might be able to help me with that. Six zero zero three two four two. Well, there you go. So basically, he a little over six foot two forty. That suggests he's a better fit off the ball. Maybe he's a better fit at inside linebacker. He doesn't really have the quick twitch explosion of some of the other guys in the class. But he does have a number of moves that he's able to execute with his quickness, with his hands. He has inside ribs, has a really nice spin move uh, that we saw quite a few times on film. Uh, seems more effective cutting inside than really attacking the edge. And that, again, kind of speaks to him lacking that explosive speed uh, coming off the perimeter. Want to see him improve with disengaging from blocks. And again, that's generally you kind of expect it's going to be an issue with a guy of his size uh, and his hand usage in terms of winning outside as well. So those are kind of the developmental things we want to see. Still kind of defining what he is. Again, I mentioned maybe he's a better fit at inside back or the next level, but I got to think he's going to be continue to play more of that uh, outside linebacker role with Oklahoma with Oklahoma, even though they moved him around a bit last year. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, he, I, I can see them continuing to want to use him outside in that capacity because he has been productive. I mean, last year, nine sacks, 14 hits, 36 hurries. But maybe as an NFL projection, maybe he, you know, like you said, maybe he switches inside or he switches off the ball because he does almost sort of have like, you know, a middle linebacker build. And, you know, when, when you – when you mention his inside moves, I mean, his, he's got like a, a, an inside counter like repertoire that no one else in this class has. I mean, he can keep winning inside repeatedly. So you almost want to see him with like a two way go blitzing an A gap or something like that. You know what I mean? Like from, uh, you know, and almost like, a, and I don't want to compare him to a Hassan Reddick, but that sort of thing where maybe you you use a lot of edge stuff in college and then you move off the ball, you know, in the NFL, but you're still an effective pass rusher and blitzer. So an interesting guy, and it'll be interesting to see, again, like how he develops this year. You know, one thing that was a little bit concerning about him uh, was his, it, um, he had like, actually, what, nine of the 13 games, he generated at least four pressures. So I, that was uh, actually not concerned. It's actually pretty awesome. Um, so that was, you know, he he effectively generated pressure throughout the, you know, throughout the season. So again, mm -hmm. consistent, but like, where do you, where do you see his year going, Josh? Yeah, I, I think he's going to be even better this year, especially when you talk about a guy that has a multitude of moves. Um, can play outside, can play inside as well. And I think in general, when you think about that Oklahoma roster, at least what they had on defense last year, that was a pretty thin unit for them all around uh, on that side of the ball last year. And w without knowing the names and everyone else who's on there, I can't help but think that because they're Oklahoma, they're just naturally going to be better, more experienced this season. And I think that's going to help him because he was really that one guy that was – that threat, especially in terms of being a pass rusher last year. Yeah. Jordan, let's move this along. Uh, we got another ACC edge rusher to talk about here. Duke edgy of four from wake forest. So many uh, interesting thing about him. And we've talked about a number of different guys already that win a number of different ways. Edgy of four is kind of our counter rusher. I, right? as mm -hmm. is the way I like to describe him plays at a solid pod pad level, uh, loves the inside arm over technique He's not slow twitch, but he's not really going to win off the edge with pure explosion at the snap. Uh, he really needs to be able to uh, win with his hands, with his quickness, get off the initial blocker, and that's really his best trait. 
his ability to get off one-on-one blocks, and that really above the pass rushing, which was solid last year, but it's his ability to get off those one-on-one blocks that really makes him a viable player against the run. Yeah, and it, again, just you know, stylistically, as you mentioned, he's he's a uh, you know what we would call a counter rusher, so he's not necessarily taking off at the snap and has this plan of how he's going to attack a you know the tackle's outside shoulder. He's almost sort of like letting you know as we mentioned counter rusher he's letting the offensive lineman sort of like punch and declare what he's going to try to do first mm-hmm. and then he acts off of it you know like we saw one rep that was really impressive high level hand usage where you know a tackle went to punch him and he grabbed his hand and then you know pinned it to his own body and executed like a spin move so it's you know it's almost like he's got like some sort of judo mma background or something a lot of really high level hand usage uh from duke but um you know, a sort of odd production. You know, he had 11 sacks with just 19 hurries. You know, so I, I don't know that he's necessarily going to consistently generate a, a, a ton of pressure, but he does generate the sort of counter pressure and provides like a stylistic difference. Um, but yeah, really, really interesting player. What do you what do you see for him this year? Yeah, that's you know what that to me that's the kind of thing that really translates well going forward. Um, I, I want to see ability against the run. I want to see how he uses his hands to set up a variety of moves to disengage from blocks. I, I think you can learn how to be a pass rusher throughout if you have those skills. So I think we're going to continue to see that develop from him. Again, yeah, obviously you want to see the speed and explosion off the edge like the next guy we're going to talk about has. But at the same time, if you have the rest of that skill set, like I think Edgy Afford does, I think he's going to end up being a very, very productive player and a really intriguing prospect for the next level. Uh, the next guy I was hinting at, Jordan, guy from your neck of the woods, Karan Crump from Arizona State, mm. uh, very undersized, 602-1-218. Uh, so obviously he needs to add bulk, but he can explode off the edge. He consistently wins with speed and athleticism outside. Uh, He really has an extra gear that helps him close effectively in space. That was something that I really liked about him. Um, He can play with his hand in the dirt. He can line up on the edge, uh, both inside and outside. Physicality, that's the big issue with him to me, Jordan. He needs to get stronger, uh, not just to hold up at the point of attack, but he needs to be more physical uh, both against the run and against pass blockers. Totally agree. I he Crump is a guy who caught my eye. Uh, I think it was last year's spring game because he's a JUCO guy, and I was watching their spring game. And I, again, I just see this guy running around like crazy, just super twitchy, super explosive. Uh, you know, just making plays all over the place. And uh, I was like, oh wow, I got to keep an eye on this Crump kid. And then you know, last year he just sort of really splashed onto the scene in a big way, at least as far as pass rush production goes. You know, he had 10 sacks. But, you know, what you mentioned, Josh, I mean, he's only 6'2", 218. Uh, you know, so sometimes I wonder where to play him because he hasn't been super successful against the run. You know, he, as you mentioned, he's not super physical with blockers, not super physical in the run game. I think you looked it up, and he only had like eight run stops last year. So that's mm-hmm. definitely something we're going to want to see from him. But the one thing that... Uh, you know about him is he's so interesting. It's like where do you play him, Josh? Yeah, I that is definitely an issue, especially when he has some clear issues like we talked about. So he has a lot to prove this year. His production really tailed off at the end of last season. That's a big concern. Last three games, he had no sacks, uh, just three hits and two hurries. So. Production really dropped off in uh, uh, toward the end of the season there. I, I don't know. I didn't research in terms of was there an injury that was an issue or what the story is with that. But uh, certainly from an athletic perspective, a guy that you find interesting. But ultimately, you can't just be a pure speed guy off the edge. You have to have an arsenal of moves and you have to have a physical presence. Because we've seen time and time again the last couple of years, guys that are super undersized like him, it doesn't matter what their production is in terms of being a pass rusher, uh, what their athletic level is. They're they're not going to go get taken high, and there's a very finite amount of playing time available to them at the next level. Yeah, and then you know again, two hundred and eighteen pounds. So yeah. <laughs> I you know I don't I don't know what he is now. Um, you know, I'm sure he's added some bulk, but again, I just, it's super 
athletic and twitchy, but just not doesn't have you know the ideal size that you would want for an edge rusher. So maybe he plays them off the ball, and you sort of you know you know blitz him and things like that. But yeah, it's it's a player that we would like to see <clears throat> develop physically and uh, sort of this year, and then just sort of you become a bit more well rounded uh, this year, his senior year. But uh, definitely a player who will stick out on tape to people when they watch him. Um, mm-hmm. And then I want to stick out out west, Josh, with the Pac-12 with um, another player, U- Uchenna and Wosu from USC. You know, they and Wosu is is um, you know, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't really know that he necessarily belongs on the list of the top, you know, returning pass rushers. I mean, they only had three sacks and nine hits and 26. Oh, come on, season. Jordan. You have him as your number one overall pick. Uh, you want to have 10,000 of his babies. No, He's your guy. Not, <laughs> nothing like that exactly. But like, you know, in, I from watching USC and from watching their spring and, and hearing about his spring, he's a guy that I really think is sort of going to have a big season and sort of, you know, uh, again, I'm sort of, sort of projecting him as having a breakout year. Um, now, again, you know, Josh, we, you know, we can kind of go back and forth on him. You know, what I'm seeing is he's sort of, you know, he's got the athleticism, the flexibility to, to be a consistent edge rush threat. You know, I know that the, you know, the production hasn't been there yet. You know, we'd like to see that. You know, he sort of started the natural skill progression of being a, a sound run defender first. You know, and we see it on tape. He can really set the edge well, uh, really effective in that mm-hmm. capacity. But he just hasn't really turned on the all the you know the pass rush production yet. I mean, he can win outside with speed or with a long arm move or or with a rip. Uh, very effective with a with a two way go and has an inside rush. Uh, I like his hands. I like his balance. Uh, but you know, the thing about right now is he's still not. I don't know. Technically, you know, well refined. You know, like there's times where I see him winning, but he's he's winning even though he missed, you know, with his hand placement at first, or even though he lost the initial hand battle, he's still winning because he could win with, you know, athleticism or or leverage or things like that. But again, he still seems kind of raw to me. Uh, you know, what do you? you know, I, I know that you probably don't see him at the exact same level as I do, but Josh, what do you what do you see from Inwosu? Do you? I know you probably don't really expect him to, to break out as much as I am, but what do you what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things where you get a athletic guy that goes to USC, you kind of expect that progression. But as you, as you said, when you have a player that starts off as the run defender first, I think there's some hope to that um, because we know he can anchor on the edge. We know he, he has a feeling for that. And you just hope he can learn everything else. I think right now he's an athlete and doesn't really know how to use his athleticism, if, if that makes sense. Uh, he has all those pieces in place, but – He's got to put them all together, and he's going to have to be more physical in terms of his rush, uh, in terms of being a rusher, um, learning how to, again, use those hands to counter, to, to keep himself free more so against the rush than, when, than or more like he does in the, uh, in the run game than we see from the the pass rush. So, I mean, there, but there's a lot of pieces to work with there. So I don't think he's going to be the number one overall player like you do, (laughs) but at the same time, I I think there's some clear room for development with him. And uh, real quick, before I move on to the next guy, you had talked about watching him in the spring game and how he was a standout there. And they kind of talked about at USC, how he looks, he looks bigger, stronger and, and uh, was really one of the better performers throughout the spring game. And, and that tends to be an indication, too, that we can expect bigger things from him uh, this year as well. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, if he doesn't generate like an 8-10 to 10 sack season, I'm going to definitely catch some grief from you and Steve for including him on this list. So hopefully he has the season that I think he can have and, uh, and, and performs well. Uh, you know, all right, I, it's, it's with a heavy, a heavy heart that I leave my beloved West Coast and go all the way back to the friggin' ACC again yep. to talk about uh, NC State's Bradley Chubb. Again, I, it's uh, all these different body sizes. This guy, his, I mean, his size, Josh, you know, a lot of times these edge rushers, you know, we mentioned Kron Crump's only 218 pounds. And like Bradley Chubb is like the exact opposite. He's like, you know, he's 6'3", but he's, he's a legit 275 pounds. You know, what I mean, that's a lot of power in a, in a, you know, like in a lower body for the for these college edge players. Don't you think? 
Yeah, as, especially being an underclassman. I mean, he's got real good size. Just in general, he kind of reminds me a bit of Shaq Lawson. I was doing some uh, NFL work earlier today looking at Buffalo, so maybe that's why I have Lawson in my head. But in terms of he's a guy that he's a he's definitely a good enough athlete, but he doesn't have elite explosiveness off the edge. He's not just going to beat guys with pure speed like, like Crump. We talked about a little bit ago, but he has a good feel for it in terms of his ability to get off blocks, uh, the playing the run, uh, fifth best returning run game, run grade among edge players wow. this season. So that's certainly uh, a positive there. And, and I think we're going to see his production, certainly in terms of being a pass rusher, that's going to continue to progress because he has a, a variety of moves in his arsenal. Definitely looks like that strong side and that doesn't have to be the first man moving off the ball at all times, but because of his strength, he can play both the run and get after the passer. I agree. You know, you said that lower body bulk and his strength and, you know, the fact that he's already shown to be the, what, the fifth best returning run grade among edge players. So, you know, that aspect of his game is already, you know, well-defined and productive. Uh, you know, and he's been consistent as a pass rusher. I mean, he hasn't had like a double digit sack season yet, but he's had nine sacks uh, the last two years in a row. So maybe this year is the year he kind of, you know, gets over that hump and posts a little bit more. But as you mentioned, I think that his role in the at the next level isn't necessarily going to be the guy that, you know, they're expecting to get double digit sacks. I think he's going to be a guy that they are expecting to, you know, set a heavy edge and, you know, provide some pass rush presence. Uh, and that's definitely, you know, what he could do. So there's a lot to like about about Chubb. Um, moving on, we're going to get to uh, a couple of guys from your neck of the woods, Josh, being mm-hmm. our, our Big Ten analyst. So we got we had two Ohio State guys. Uh, why don't you start us off by talking about Taekwon Lewis, Josh? Mm-hmm. Let's go over some of his numbers first. Uh, 13.3 p- uh, pass rush productivity. That's uh, Was that seventh or second among f- uh, 43 defensive Number ends two. returning? Yeah, number two. So pass rush productivity is way up there. Um, He's a guy that when I look at him, I think Terrell sucks. He's got the same huge ass. He's not explosive (laughs) off the ball, but he's just a a pure power guy. And he's a guy that it's, it's tough to move. He's really strong against the run. And he did a lot to develop his pass rush skill set this past year. In 2015, I believe, he was significantly better against the run than the pass. But as we talked about earlier with some of these other guys, you have that natural progression that you want to see guys starting off with the run game first and then developing the pass skill set. I think we saw some of that with Lewis. Um, he has an effective bull rush. I think he can add even more weight if he needs to. Uh, but again, back to Terrell Suggs, I, I think you can play strong side defensive end. I really like him as that power outside linebacker that Baltimore uses has used Suggs in so successfully for so long. I think he's he'd be a great fit in a in a scheme like that. Yeah, he uh, reminded me, you know, when we were watching some of these guys back to back, physically, he sort of reminded me of a, a, a stronger but less athletic version of Bradley Chubb. You know, mm-hmm. so, like you said, like someone who can be that sort of strong edge player, uh, but again, just not as as proficient from you know from a pass rush standpoint as uh, as Chubb. Uh, uh, to this point anyways, although last year he did have a pretty productive season. Um, the other guy from Ohio State who is probably uh, didn't quite get there with his, with his sack production but should have a pretty good year is, is Sam Hubbard. Yeah, he's an interesting one in part because you have Nick Bosa there as well. And I think we, as we saw as the year went on, Bosa started to get uh, more reps – and I think that cut into Hubbard a little bit more than it did Lewis because, again, Lewis is that power guy, and you want to have that guy uh, set in the edge against the run a little more consistently, which he's going to be able to. Hubbard is a little bit undeveloped in some of his skills. Uh, one of the interesting things about him is that he was a significantly better rusher rushing from the left side, uh, 16.5 pass rush productivity on the left, only 10.7 on the right side. Although the last four or five games, if I remember correctly, Jordan, he actually about 90% of his rushes 
came off the right side where he was less adept at. So I thought that was really interesting that they didn't necessarily put him in a position to succeed down the down the stretch. Um, I liked his uh, run stop percentage. That was really solid. So he's kind of the opposite of Lewis in terms of he was the guy that flashed all the pass rushing ability in 2015 and improved that run defense. Uh, but he's a guy that he gets way too aggressive at times, and that's going to be an issue that he needs to work with. He tends to get himself sealed out of plays by overcommitting to his gaps at times, but he's got that quickness, that athleticism you see off the ball. Um, not Again, not super explosive, not a top-end guy, so not going to be in the elite, necessarily first-round range of guys. But if he can improve that upper body strength, and uh, just get better at defeating blocks more consistently with his hands. Uh, it might be tough for him to prove, improve statistically because, again, he's kind of behind the eight ball because of the depth, because of Lewis, because of Bosa. But I think he's a guy that could end up being uh, maybe a better pro than what we'll see in college at Ohio State. Yeah, he's gonna. It's gonna be a situation that you have to monitor, like as you mentioned, because of even though Bosa's not draft eligible, so not really you know breaking him right. down here, but because of his presence there, you know they have three you know NFL at least three NFL caliber defensive end you know slash edge players, so it's definitely gonna impact Hubbard's you know his sta- his snaps this year. You know, I mean, there's there's no way around it. So that's gonna be something that you're definitely gonna have to you know or we'll definitely have to keep an eye on. Um, you know, it's, Hubbard only had four sacks, 11 hits, and 25 hurries last year. You know, mm-hmm. and, and when you mention like the, the the style differences between Lewis and Hubbard, it's kind of funny to see. You know, you would expect Lewis to have a better run stop percentage than Hubbard, but Hubbard actually had a higher one, which is interesting. So, the, right, you know, two different players stylistically, and if if Bosa wasn't in the mix, I would say you'd have a pretty good bookend pair there. Uh, but again, it's been really interesting to see how Bosa works in a talented team, but they they, they usually are. Um, all right, moving on, Josh, we're going to go to uh, the last pass rusher we're going to talk about. And again, terrible first name on this prospect, and that's Josh Sweat from Florida State. Oh, that's my favorite guy. He, uh, he <laughs> I know it sounds like the workout version of you. He <laughs> is like uh, really athletic. I remember him coming out of high school. It was like an Army All-American game or something, I forget, but just super athletic. Uh, or maybe this was a spark thing, I think. But anyways, he was just you know, really impressed with him. Just even in high school, uh, highly touted recruit, you know, goes to Florida State, you know, had some serious production last year, had, you know, uh, 10 sacks. But some of his production is kind of misleading, you know, and it almost seems like he's sort of, you know, winning with athleticism more at this point. I mean, nine of his 10 sacks came over the course of just four games. Right. Uh, and his pass rush productivity is 6.7, only ranks 60th among, you know, returning 34 OLBs is which we have uh, their defense marked at. So what do you think about Josh Sweat, Josh, besides that terrible first name? Yeah, I, I think consistency is going to be the key with him, and the key to getting that is going to be his ability to get off blocks once he's engaged. He can win initially off the snap with his speed and explosion. He has that bend to, to take the edge, but he needs to add weight to that 250-pound frame. Once guys lock on, they're really able to physically control him. Uh, that's definitely an issue. He had a little bit of injury issues last year. Uh, he had a meniscus tear. That caused him to miss a game against South Florida. Also limited him in a couple of other games. But you have to look at him physically, and you like his his length, uh, ability to set the edge, Got to get better against blockers, though. So we'll see if he can improve. If he's improved his strength this offseason, that's going to be the key for him going forward in terms of rounding out that and being more consistent with that productivity in all parts of this game. Yeah, because he has that NFL athleticism. So we just mm-hmm. want to see him sort of, you know, brush up on his technique this year. So hope I, I, you know, and I think he can do it. So he'll be he'll be a fun player to watch. I just again like to see some of his production spread out a little bit more, be a little bit more consistent, and you know, clean up some of those other parts of his game. All right, Josh, that's that's actually, you know, so it takes us through the top group of, you know, edge players. You know, a lot of players can, you know, there's a lot of still other good ones out there. We just wanted to hit on some of the top guys, uh, you know, for you guys. And then that is going to wrap up our segment for the 2018 draft. And now we are going to turn our attention back to the 2017 draft, and we're going to go inside the war room josh uh you know i i i I really like these segments again because it's even if you're not a fan of the team 
you know, in particular, you get to learn, you know, why they took their, you know, certain players or what their philosophies are. So I, I think it's fascinating stuff. We are on the East Coast right now. We are focusing on starting with the Philadelphia Eagles and going into their draft from last year. You know, the first thing that sort of like stood out to me about it is there's uh, kind of, a, you know, new roles for, for everybody there now. You know, Howie Roseman used to be the more like a traditional GM, but when he sort of got pushed out of the building uh, when, you know, there was a restructure under Chip Kelly, um, now that he's sort of back in control, he's the executive vice president of football operations, but he's almost sort of like a above a GM, and they brought in Joe Douglas from Baltimore to be the VP of player personnel and sort of head up their, their personnel department. So while Howie's still sort of in charge, he seems to be a bit more hands-off uh, with Joe Douglas a bit more hands-on uh, and Andy Weidel, their assistant director of player personnel. Um, so yeah, Joe Douglas and Andy Weidel build the, they build the board basically, you know, it's, they are a team that wanted to really, really focus, uh, along the offensive, actually along both lines, you know, in, mm-hmm. in the way that the Cowboys sort of view their identity as the offensive line, the Eagles sort of view it as being, you know, the opposite. They view it as they're, they're the defensive line is sort of the identity of their team. Uh, and they, you know, and added to it in this draft as well. But they, you know, really, really focus on that defensive line, and they and they did in the first round. Uh, and then when when they looked at their picks, and we'll get to their picks, but they got they ended up with two of their top fourteen players on their board, which is really, really Im- impressive. Um, all right, we're getting it to their first player here, Josh Derek Barnett. They took who's just super productive pass rusher. Why don't Why don't you tell us what they liked about Derek Barnett? The the first thing I want to say about Barnett, and it's going to hold true with quite a few of their of their uh, picks in terms of athleticism versus production. Um, Douglas made the point to say that the tape the tape takes you to the player. That was the quote from him, and I think, yeah. boy, there are a few players in this draft that that holds more true than than it does for Derek Barnett. That's true. Uh, didn't have the elite measurables, but boy, he does everything in terms of, uh, of what you want to see from an edge guy. Just excellent hand usage, consistently productive. I think he was the number two highest graded edge player each of the last two seasons. Uh, so his production is way up there. Um, has the first step, has has toughness. Um, highly proficient at the top of his rush, which was something they talked about. So in terms of once he once he beats the guy initially, he can turn the corner, he can finish, kind of the anti uh, Brandon Graham, if you will, because Graham is has made a very solid career for Philly out of uh, harassing the quarterback, but he doesn't necessarily always finish. So. I, from their perspective, I think they're expecting a little bit more from Barnett in terms of his ability to bring the quarterback down uh, to finish those uh, tackles for loss against the run. You're getting a real strong player that can play every down, and I, I just think he's a guy that, and you could talk a little bit about this, Jordan, where when you think about the way the draft played out, they already have their quarterback. They got him last year in Carson Wentz. They had three quarterbacks going for him. That helped them. All the offensive skill players that went in the top 10, that helped them as well to get Barnett, a guy that we viewed as really one of the top five players in this entire class at number 14. Yeah, he was the guy they really wanted. So, you know, as you mentioned, the the quarterbacks and the wide receivers going early, you know, pushed him down to them, which they were really, really excited about. Uh, you know, and, and I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the differences between, you know, Barnett and a Miles Garrett coming out, that Barnett, when I watched him in college, was very technically sound, always seemed to rush for the plan. You know, his hands are very, you know, tied to his feet and just had so many different moves. And, you know, and they mentioned that the Eagles mentioned that too. You know, they said, they said he's got a speed rush, he's power, he goes speed to power. Like I said, knows, knows how to finish when he gets to the top of his rush. So they, they you know, they, they really liked all those aspects of it. But you know, one of the things that I thought was interesting, and it goes back to the tape and production, is again, he didn't test as well as some of the other edge players. And a lot of times in the first round, you know, the NFL teams always want to get to get the freaky athlete, uh, height, weight, speed guys and, and instead of, you know, valuing college production. But the Eagles didn't do that. The Eagles valued his production and really wanted to add that to their to their haul. And they did. And much like the Cowboys, they, you know, went past rusher early, knowing, I think, that they could get more corners mm-hmm. later. 
um, which they ended up doing uh, with their second round pick, which, you know, we had mentioned they got two of their top 14 picks and they got Sidney Jones from Washington in the second round. Um, you know, again, if you followed the draft, you know that he was a, a top player. They, they viewed him as a top 15 talent and he was in their top tier players, but then, you know, there's his pro day, uh, what is it, the last drill or something like that. He ends up messing up his Achilles. So he ends up tumbling in, in the draft, and they, you know, again, were lucky enough to, to, to snag him. So, you know, again, sort of you know, very lucky for them that that took place, unfortunate for the player. But what do you, what do you see that they liked about Sidney Jones? Yeah, I, I think there's a point to be made here that they were one of the teams that it made a lot of sense to be willing to take – a guy that had some injury concerns and may or may not be available uh, this year. They have a second-year quarterback who's clearly their guy. Obviously, everyone wants to win. Everyone wants to win now. And if they and if they don't show progression as a team, if Carson Wentz doesn't show progression, sure, there's going to be pressure in 2018. But that being said, they don't have to go win 12 games at the Super Bowl and and you know have just huge success this season they have a little bit of time to work with development so not having a guy like Sidney Jones available right away I think that's okay for a team like them and then they talked about asking themselves would they trade the number 43 overall pick this year which was the pick they took him for a top 15 player next year obviously the answer was yes so I think that kind of tells you how they were looking at him in terms of him being a top flight player. Uh, they talked about if you can get a number one corner, that changes what you can do defensively. And and they're right about that. You look at teams that have that top tier corner and that's able to shut down half the field. Uh, that really, really increases the ability of the entire rest of the defense. So you look at those first two picks they had, Jordan, how they really, in, in a sense, focused on their pa- on the defensive passing game in terms of getting a guy that's a known top producer in terms of pass rush and then pairing that with a corner that they think is going to be a number one lockdown guy. That was really a central focus to what they did with those first couple of picks. Yeah, and it was an interesting pick. And you mentioned they, you know, they asked themselves would they trade the, the forty three pick this year for the top fifteen player next year, and that was that was really kind of a cool way to approach it. I thought, mm-hmm. and came led them to a, a, a pretty solid answer because, like you said, they view him as a number one corner. I mean, they view him as a man cover corner. They like his ball skills. They like his, you know, his length. I mean, his his. I mean college quarterbacks try to avoid him like the plague last year. I mean, yeah. he is a guy that can be a number one corner, you know, and he does have the Achilles injury, but they did a ton of research, Josh, where they talked to doctors from other teams. They talked to their own doctors who have experience with Achilles injuries. They talked to doctors from other sports uh, as well about the, uh, you know, Achilles injuries of, you know, recovery of explosive athletes. So I thought that was really interesting that they, you know, went into all that, to try to you know make sure that they felt comfortable with the pick, and then that all you know all that the, all the medical stuff sort of came back to his checking out as if out he can make a full recovery, but then he's only twenty, Josh. Yeah, I was going to make that point too. That's that's a big deal too. So you even think even if this is a lost year, he's only going to be twenty one when he starts next season. So right. that's that's a big bonus as well. It's not like they're getting a fifth year senior who's twenty three turning twenty four in the middle of the year. Then all of a sudden they've got a what would essentially amount to a 25 year old rookie? No, they they're gonna. He's not gonna get reached that until he's through, uh, beyond through his first contract. So yeah. that's certainly a big bonus to him as well. Yeah, and it was. I mean, again, and and maybe it goes back to as you said, like the state of their you know their team and and their building process and the fact that you know Howie Rosen's pretty secure in, in his spot that they could you know go ahead and take this player and sort of you know possibly even redshirt him if they need to. But again, they have a a number one corner. You know, and a young number one corner when he ends up being healthy, you know, and, and Andy Weidel said, you know, sometimes you can catch a falling star in the draft, and, and we felt like we did catch one here, and, and I, I agree with them. It's a great, great, great pick for them, and, you know, that Barnett and, uh, you know, Jones, when healthy, are really going to complement each other as well, you know, one on the front end and one on the back end, like you, like you said, sort of impacting that pass game. All right, moving on, Josh, they did... Again, the Eagles, they, they, they listened to our advice. 
uh, and double mm-hmm. dipped, double dipped at the cornerback position in taking uh, Rasul Douglas from West Virginia, who's a guy we saw, uh, you know, at the Senior Bowl and and liked him. What did you think about their their strategy to go back to back with corners here? Yeah, obviously we've talked about it in prior weeks. I, I think it was smart to do. Uh, I, one of the interesting things about Douglas that they talked about is they like to play some more zone and they like the way he reacts to the ball in zone. So schematically they felt like he was more ready to play uh, quickly. And, and quite frankly, with Sidney Jones possibly not being able to contribute uh, much of much of anything this year, they, they really needed to get a guy that could still be productive this year, could offer some value to them. So Douglas made a lot of sense uh, for them going forward uh, with this pick. Also, man, you look at some of their other picks, Jordan. They're one of those teams that I think maybe is kind of a quiet draft just because they're in the middle and they weren't jumping around all over the place like they were last year, making a big splash at quarterback. But I really love what they did in the draft on, on a number of levels. Their next pick, Mac Hollins, receiver, uh, big-time playmaker out of North Carolina. Uh, he's a PFF favorite. Six foot four guy that can run, has size. Um, they thought that if he didn't have the collarbone this year, that he could have gone a couple rounds before what he actually did. Uh, so, and here's here's the most intriguing quote on him that I that I uh, that I found from their collection of quotes. We're not looking to draft special teams players in the fourth round, and and I found that really interesting because when you think about Day three, you you trying to find guys that they're going to produce a number of ways, and certainly one of them is special teams. But I think there's also something to be said that at least in the fourth round, they want guys that can contribute now. First off, that's probably a little bit to do with their roster, that they need to improve the talent throughout. But also, I, I think it, there's a point to be made that just because we're in the fourth round, that doesn't mean you're drafting fourth guys that are fourth round value on your board. Typically, when you get to like the seventh round toward the end of the draft, most teams are taking players that have a fourth or fifth round grade on their board. So there's still a lot of value with those fourth round picks. I would assume they probably had a second, third round grade on Hollins. So when you're talking second, third round grade, you're looking at a guy that you want starting uh, maybe not immediately, but certainly down the road, and you think there's a lot of upside to that. So I thought that was very interesting. That tells you kind of the expectation they have for Hollins coming into this year. Yeah, it's definitely not just a you know a special teams ability you know pick mm-hmm. you know which he clearly has, and, and I'm sure he'll be playing right away on special teams. But yeah, they view him as an eventual starter, you know, and that you know sort of that big wide receiver role. So that's you know he's got all the speed, he's got all the size, he's got you know sort of everything there. So I mean, again, if, if he ends up developing into us, they're starting sort of big, you know, wide receiver. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a great get to get there, you know, in the fourth round. Um, Moving on to to their next player they drafted, who we you and I were big fans of, uh, mm-hmm. and that's San Diego State running back Danell Pumphrey. They uh, are also going to use him. You know, in addition to running back, they're also going to use him as a, as a returner. But they were looking specifically for a, a three down back type player, and, and you know, and he is that because he is so effective in the past game. You know, they mentioned his production. His production is. Uh, you know, un- unmatched in college football. He's got, yeah. you know, great feet, great hands. Uh, and, and in the same way that you and I saw him and said, you know what, this guy can still play in the NFL, even though he's small, um, you know, they, they saw the same things on film that, that, that we saw, you know, when you can totally see that from those quotes, you know, about, uh, about him. Yeah. The interesting quote from Douglas was, uh, don't let the size fool you. He's a little dog that thinks he's a big dog, and he plays that way. And that's one of the things that shocked me I, uh, watching him on film. And I was lucky enough to get to uh, grade firsthand a couple of San Diego State's games is how effective he was running between the tackles. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, he has the ability to make himself very small. He's already small. And that certainly helps in terms of his ability to hide behind blockers. Um, experience running with a fullback very effectively. That's certainly nice. But I think he works well in the zone because he has great vision. And he's not afraid to cut it back inside uh, to lay a shoulder into a guy to initiate contact. I, I I think that comment makes perfect sense with what we saw on film with him. Uh he, 
there's just so much that he brings to the table. And then you look at the fact that he has the perfect model for him already in place there in Philly to learn from. And Darren Sproles, a uh, similar type player, a little, little jitterbug who can provide immense production in terms of not just special teams, but also the passing game, but also probably a little bit better running between the tackles than he's ever getting credit for just because he's so small. Everyone just assumes he can't do that. Uh, I, I like him in all facets. Uh, obviously, we have fancy people that are going to be listening to this, especially in the off season. That's a guy I want to draft late because you talked about them wanting a three down back. They're basically saying that he's going to get opportunities to do that. And I, I think he could be just a major big time performer for this young and developing team this year. Yeah, because he's a guy that you could line up out at slot receiver. Uh, you know, oh, and, totally. Yeah, and he could play that position no problem. So yeah, I mean, you could go, yeah. you could run out and you know an eleven personnel on third down, and then and then motion him out to the slot and go empty and get a mismatch on a, on a smaller player. Um, all right, so moving on, they, the next player they took was was Shelton Gibson, uh, another wide receiver, uh, West Virginia speed guy. And then the next pick they took was, was Nate Jerry, uh, a safety from Nebraska. This is a really interesting pick, and, and uh, I, I really like what they're going to do with this guy. Why don't you tell us about Nate Jerry, Josh? Yeah, Gary uh, was certainly a PFF favorite. If I had had a vote for Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, it wouldn't have been Peppers. It would have been Gary because Gary was really outstanding in every facet. Um, he's a safety, but... They're actually going to play him at linebacker. That's something they talked about. Um, they said uh, this draft at linebacker was a little bit shorter than it normally is at the position. And uh, when they look at him as a guy, uh, they thought he had a lot of traits to eventually develop into a starter and at minimum can help on third and fourth down. And, and I think that's pretty telling because when you watch Gary on film, he's not a guy you want ever in a single high situation because he's just not the type of athlete that can run uh, with guys downfield and one-on-one coverage. He's not a guy that can recover once he's beaten. But in terms of uh, a too high look as a safety in the box, he's very effective because he's very instinctive. He's constantly uh, around the ball, breaking up passes, delivering big hits, uh, making interceptions and, and uh, tossing the ball back at the quarterback after he picks him off like he did to uh, our buddy at Wyoming that we already talked about because Gary's a bit of a punk and you love that on your on your uh, back end defenders. It's just there's a lot you can do with him if you utilize him if you utilize him properly. And I think Philly kind of has a good handle uh, based on what they said uh, on what his strengths are. And I'm excited to see how he performs for them because I think he's going to far outperform. Uh, his draft status. No, I agree. And, and he's a good player that they can, you know, again, add some athleticism to the second level there. I'm really excited to watch that conversion. The last player they took was a, a player I was higher on than, than a lot of the people here in PFF. And that's Elijah Qualls, the defensive lineman from Washington. Uh, again, quick, productive. I thought he could be moved all around. Uh, you know, again, he just fit a little physically limited in that he's got, you know, some sort of short arm, sort of lax length. But they had him rated in higher than the sixth round. And I think it's a, a good, good value versatility, you know, to pick there. Um, all right. That it wraps it up for the NFC East team and the Philadelphia Eagles. Now we're going to go inside an AFC East war room, and that is the Miami Dolphins. So, again, um, this was the second draft for Chris Greer as the GM of the Dolphins. So you still have Mike Tannenbaum there as EVP of like football operations and then Chris Greer there as the GM. Now, I mean, I know that for a fact they really, really love their head coach, Adam Gase, but I don't know, it didn't really seem like Gase was super involved you know, in, the, in, the, in the player process, in the, you know, in the draft process. I think they, probably, you know, they brought in the coaches in the same way that some teams do, but he didn't seem to have the input that you know, a lot of other head coaches do uh, around the league. Um, Although, like Mike Tannenbaum said, like philosophically said, I believe we're here to serve the coaches. So, you know, they try to get the players that the coaches want if they can. Uh, you know, and they, and they did that this year. They made a real big emphasis this year on bolstering their front seven and the free agency and draft. 
and then four of their seven picks were front seven players. So, you know, that's really an area they wanted to just get bigger, faster, younger, deeper, and they and they did that. Um, most of the players, it looks like they came from big schools and good programs, mm-hmm. all seven picks from Power 5 schools. Um, and then I looked back, and only one pick from the last 15 was actually from outside the Power 5, and that was Brandon Dowdy from Western Kentucky. Uh, so... Take us, Josh. They, the first round, they went with the pass rusher from Missouri, Charles Harris. What did they like about Charles Harris? Mm-hmm. They talked about his quickness, speed, explosion off the edge, ability to rush the passer. Uh, they also liked his ability to rush inside. Uh, it definitely has some counter moves. That's one of the things you're going to get when you uh, get a Missouri edge guy. They, they seem to really coach their guys up uh in terms of hand usage so i think you're going to get a guy that's fairly advanced with that Hmm. and he's going to a good situation to where while he wasn't as productive against the run as you would have hoped he would have progressed into this past season they don't necessarily need that out of him this year they can really just focus on his edge rushing for now while he develops the other parts of his game um so i i I think he makes a lot of sense for them, uh, they liked attitude, competitiveness. That was kind of a general theme across the board for them, but that was something that they really uh, liked with him. And another, another interesting point that uh, Greer mentioned is that they try to stay away from him purposely in, in terms of, I guess, not kind of Tip showing in, interest yeah. in him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they wanted to take him. And certainly when I think back to the process – there was a lot of talk about, you know, maybe Taco Charlton is a good fit at that point. And I still think he would have been a good fit there, but everyone kind of assumed Charles Harris was going to go a little bit later. Uh, so the fact that he was one of the two guys that they really keyed on at that at that point, that uh, they did a good job of at least hiding the fact that they were so interested in him at that stage. Yeah, and they did a good job of, again, you know, adding a pass rusher, an edge rush presence to their front seven. You know, as, they, again, they tried to bolster their front seven. The next pick, they also bolstered their front seven with, um, you know, linebacker from Ohio State, Raquan McMillan. Uh, again, you know, two-time captain. They, they really liked, uh, you know, his, his sort of his leadership style and being a sort of quarterback of the defense. You know, mm-hmm. I, I know you, you were much more familiar with McMillan because he came out of your conference. What, what did they like about McMillan, Josh? Yeah, I think the things that they repeatedly cited that they liked about him, those are definitely his strengths. Uh, Greer talked about when you, when you talk to the guys at Ohio State, they talk about this guy's intellect, how smart he is, how he can line everybody up. And that may not translate into our grading because obviously we're just talking about pre-snap adjustments and uh, there's just not really a way to quantify that or, or figure that out. But I, especially when you look at middle linebackers, that's still something that NFL teams really, really value above, you know, maybe some of the athletic traits and some of the other concerns you have with McMillan. When I, when I watch him on film in terms of his playing ability, I worry about him on third down. I know he ran well at the combine, but I didn't feel like he played up to that ability. I, I think there's some hesitancy in coverage, doesn't have a real strong feel for it at times. And as big and strong as he looks, he's not nearly as consistent getting off blocks as uh, I think he could be. That was something that they cited, that they liked about him, but I don't think he showed that yet on film. I think he has the body type to do it, but he needs to get better at that going forward. And uh, so I'm, I'm interested to see how much he plays right away. Again, his ability to get everybody lined up, that's going to be something they're going to rely on pretty quickly, I think. Uh, you and I talked about yesterday when we were prepping for this, he's probably going to be the guy pretty quickly that's going to have the green sticker on his helmet. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm interested to see how quickly uh, or if at all this year if he's able to play all three downs because I think there are some concerns with him. Yeah, but I mean, like you, you, you hit the point there. I mean, when when you go back to the things they keep mentioning, they keep mentioning how intelligent he is uh, in quarterback of the defense. So, like you said, yep. I, I think he's eventual green sticker for them. You know, whether or not that happens, you know, next year, like you said, he's got some things to work on. But maybe uh, you know, another year down the road, he could be the you know the signal caller on defense for them. All right, they they also they stayed on the defensive side of the ball with their next pick uh, and, and took a corner. Thank goodness, because there were so many good corners in mm-hmm. uh, Clemson's Cordrea Tankersley uh, defensive back. So they 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 thinking they're you're going to use him on special teams as well, but they really want him to end up being a a press corner. 
You know, they think he's still yep. learning the corner position, but, you know, he's been a gunner. He's got that length and speed and ball skills. Uh, but again, they just, you know, still sort of learning the corner position and still sort of, you know, developing, uh, you know, uh, but they do like, they like his length. He's over six foot. They like his speed. You know, they think he has all the traits to become a press corner. So, Good, good pick for them. Uh, moving on, they they took uh, a guy you know that we sort of like his playing style and mentality, and that's Isaac Asiata for a guard from Utah. Josh, you want to touch on As- Asiata? Well, the biggest thing with him, and Chris Greer called him uh, said on the field he's a nasty prick. So you made this point, <laughs> and I, honestly, this might be the most anticipatory thing of the entire uh, training camp season is there's going to be at least one major fight between him and Sue in training camp, right? <laughs> oh, I so be, hope right? that happens. Everyone in Miami, you've got to have the cameras rolling constantly. We've got to see this fight between these two because you just know they're going to go at it. And uh, it's just he brings that toughness, that nasty mauler mentality that they really want from an interior lineman. And I, I've been doing – I mentioned doing some uh, pro work. I've been doing actually quite a bit on Miami – and uh, they've got some work to do on that interior line. So that's something that you love to hear about a guy uh, like Asiata and uh, something that really is missing right now with uh, their interior line, especially with last year's first round pick kicking out the left tackle this year. Uh, got some shoes to fill inside. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Asiata fitting in pretty quickly, uh, Jordan. But yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. Like you said, the, the the tone setter on the interior offensive line and a tone setter on the defensive interior offensive line, sort of going at it, uh, and like you said, uh, sort of setting the tone for the camp there. So it, yeah, that I guarantee you, there we'll probably see footage of at least one fight between those two. They did moving on the next two picks. They used uh, mm-hmm. on some defensive tackles that sort of had different, you know, builds and skill sets. They they started off with. Uh, uh, was it Devon Godshaw? Is that who you say his name is Devon? Devon Godshaw, Devin? yeah. Okay, so yeah, I can't yeah. pronounce the first name. So yeah, defensive tackle from LSU. They mentioned that they, you know, there's some off the field stuff there. So they, you know, mentioned their team security officials by name who were instrumental in actually researching, you know, everything to the point where they felt comfortable taking him, which is just kind of, you know, it goes back into these these processes. Like, you know, we mentioned the Eagles were heavily relying on their doctors. And so it's, you know, you see these teams that are like, they rely on the coaches and the doctors and the security guys and everybody, to, everybody plays a part in picking these players. Um, mm-hmm. But again, the your physical run defender from Godshaw and, and they like that he played in the SEC, uh, you know, they like his big square body and, and, and all that aspects that he brings. And then they added Vincent Taylor, defensive tackle from Oklahoma State, who they like his production as a pass rusher. So he's still a bigger body guy, but he can, you know, he can penetrate and create havoc. So those who have some sort of different playing styles. And then they, they wrapped it up, Josh, with uh, Isaiah Ford, a wide receiver from Virginia Tech. Yeah, some of the comments on, hit, on him were interesting. Now, they have – a pretty intriguing wide receiver core already, but some of the comments they made on Ford are about things that lend me to believe that they think Ford can play immediately if if he's forced to. Uh, Greer talked about him really understanding leverages, coverages, uh, running routes, ability to find the open spots and zones. So that to me is something that's going to translate very, very quickly. So while they do have obviously one of the best slot receivers in the game uh, right now, uh, in uh, Jarvis Landry, I, I think should Landry go down or, or maybe they try and find a way to get both on the field at the same time and, and maybe get a little bit more creative working inside outside with Landry. I think Ford's a guy that they think can help him pretty quickly this year. No, yep, they totally do. Yeah. And again, they, they really stuck to the film on him rather than the testing, you know, and, I can't, I mean, I can't doubt them with the way that they, you know, hit on Landry when so many people passed on him. Uh, so they, the one thing that I thought was interesting and we'll have to keep an eye on for next year is, you know, they, they keep using these drafts to sort of heavily address specific portions of their roster. You know, we mm-hmm. mentioned they had like four front seven players this year, you know, the, the draft before that they took five offensive skill players. So that's something to keep an eye on for them in the 2018 draft is they decide to just, you know, keep, you know, sort of focusing on one particular area and what that area might be. All right, Josh, that will wrap us up with the 2017 draft. And we're going to 
We're going to move on to our draft memory segment, Josh. Uh, a different Jordan, draft. I'm already embarrassed for you. <laughs> a different draft altogether. I don't know what draft this would fall under. Maybe the 2016 draft. Anyways, uh, as, we, as I've mentioned before, the draft is my passion. And uh, I was at a uh, local restaurant just doing some work and ended up like sort of hitting it off with one of the servers and, uh, you know, she saw me doing my nerdy football work and I ended up sort of asking her like, you know, out on a, on a date and, uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I took As her, you should be. I took her on a date to go see draft day, the movie. Oh, so bad. I, I, I gotta tell this story. So 2015, uh, Sitting at a buddy's house, and uh, it's the last day of the draft. Drafts wrapped up. We're all just absolute beat. And one of our guys says, "Let's watch draft day." And oh, <laughs> my God, I could not make it through 15 minutes of that awful movie. Every negative, incorrect stereotype of the draft of people in football of of front office personnel. It's it's in this movie. It, it's <laughs> Horrible. Now, Costner's done some terrible, terrible, terrible movies. This one just about takes the cake. It's awful, and, and it's really an embarrassment that you tried <laughs> to take a woman to see this movie. Not, and I not, assume you have not talked to this woman since. Not tried. I, I successfully did take her to this movie because I explained to her that you know the draft was my passion, and that if she was going to like me, that she would you know have to understand that. Uh, but yeah, so there's uh, no way she understands anything <laughs> about the actual draft after watching that movie. Yeah, well, you couldn't. Yeah, so the, basically the only parts of the movie that I ended up liking were the scenes where they would like show like Seattle and be like home of the Seahawks across the bottom. Like those those were like the only cool parts is when they would show the cities and show the team names. But yeah, so I honestly had to apologize to her on the way out of the theater. Like, you know, sorry that I took you to see this terrible, I bet terrible you made movie. her pay too, didn't you? No, I did not make her pay. But, uh, <laughs> you know, like, so yes, um, yeah, don't, don't follow my lead. Never take uh, dates to see Draft Day, the movie, especially if they come up with a sequel. Yeah. Um, definitely don't uh, take your date to see that one. The, um, you know, in case for those of you who are wondering, the rest of the date ended up going quite well uh and i do still speak to her but that was a terrible terrible idea terrible draft memory of taking this uh a beautiful young woman to go see draft day we, we need the ron burgundy sound bite from him jumping in the bear pit oh i immediately regret this decision <laughs> It was terrible. Uh, all right. So that wraps up the 2015 draft. All right, Josh, it's now the draft time machine. Oh, finally. Finally. Very excited about this. We are going to set the dial on this draft time machine to 2006. Yeah. And... Guess what I'm going to do, Josh? One of the most startling, you know, like sort of picks that I can recall in the last decade because it went against public opinion, not from a football standpoint, was Mario Williams going number one overall to Houston because everybody thought that Reggie Bush was going to be that pick and that you know Houston would take Reggie and that you know Mario would you know go later. And then, you know, Charlie Castley goes out, signs that deal with Mario, drafts Mario, and the rest is history. But we have a time machine. So I am going to change this pick. I'm going to cross out Mario Williams, and I'm going to send Reggie Bush to Houston. All right, yeah. Josh. What do you think happens now that Reggie Bush is a Texan? You know, I, I think this is an interesting one. And to the point, the last couple of times we've done Draft Time Machine, we've kind of fixed some things. We fixed a terrible top ten. Uh, we fixed the Oakland Raiders one year. We don't necessarily need to just fix things every time. That's not the point of the time machine. We just want to see what it looked like if if things were a little bit different. And quite honestly, I'm not certain that things may not have turned out better for both teams and both players had they had they gone different directions. Um, now, obviously, with Bush, the caveat we look at his body of work in the NFL. He, he was never a traditional running back, never going to be a traditional running back. So ultimately, Houston 
had to be a little bit creative in terms of how they were going to use him. But you look at the backs that they had on the roster that year, Jamil Cook, Ron Dane, uh, Sam Congato. They drafted Wally Lundy in the sixth round. He started eight games for them. That's Mm -hmm. Wally Lundy. So they they were hurting a bit on – at the running back position, for sure. So you got to think of some capacity. He really helps them out. Now, starting every game for them was Mario Williams, and it took him a little bit to get going. And yes, he turned out to be a good player, but I don't think he was ever that transcendent number one overall type player that everyone expected him to be. So when you think about, well, what if he had gone to New Orleans? You look at New Orleans' roster. Uh, what they had in terms of that defensive line, they had Charles Grant, they had Will Smith already. Inside, they had Hollis Thomas, Bryant Young. Uh, he could have been a very nice piece, part of a rotation of a team that that year, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, they ended up going to the NFC title game against Chicago. So I think that would have been better probably for Mario Williams' career if he had just been a rotational guy at that point, learning from some... Uh, big time talents in Charles Grant and Will Smith and Reggie Bush probably would have gotten a little more playing time than he did having a split with Deuce McAllister. Uh, and, and certainly I, I think in general that might help Houston a little bit more too, because when I think about what that team was at that stage, they really didn't have an identity. They rolled through a bunch of running backs through that era and, and they were still struggling with Carr at that point. Uh, Carr the first, I should, I should say, and I, I think Bush might have given a little bit more excitement, a little more identity, certainly another playmaker on offense to go uh, with their big time receiver that they had in Andre Johnson. Yeah, the other thing that like, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, Mario Williams going to New Orleans, you know, that, that sort of changes that pick. So now it's not Reggie Bush in New Orleans and they're finding all these ways to, you know, get him touches. Like now you have Mario Williams rotating in as a pass rusher. So it, it almost seems like it's going to change the identity of the Saints somewhat uh, you know, instead of just being sure. super offensive. You know, like now they have this sort of, you know, fierce rotation of pass rushers. So that would have been an interesting, you know, identity shift for them. But, I, you know, I, when you the way that you broke it down, I, I, I agree with you. I think that it almost might have been a better situation for both players and both teams. But, you know, that's the, the, uh, the beauty of our, uh, our hindsight uh, in the time machine. But, yeah, so, again, the, that would have been really, really interesting to see, and that was totally one I wanted to, to check on because, again, like, it was such a shock to where all of a sudden I remember I had a friend, like, texting me, like, they're, they're taking Mario Williams, not Reggie Bush. And I was like, oh, my goodness, it's crazy. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, but so I, Reggie Bush in Houston would have been a lot, of, a lot of fun to watch and I think would have added to some excitement. So, yeah, it would have been a fun one to change in the time machine, Josh. All righty. And that's going you know, to wrap us up. You know, excited to have Josh back. Uh, make sure you guys are checking out uh, profootballfocus.com backslash subscriptions to go find the information on Edge and Elite. Make sure you leave us a review, five star review with your Twitter, hand, Twitter handle or email address uh, so you can be entered to win our contest. Josh, anything you got to say on the way out here? You going back to Pandora? Yeah, I, I do. Kevin Costner, if you're listening, I'm sorry I said bad things about you, but you had it coming. You, you earned it, quite frankly. He's a fan of the show. Hopefully, he doesn't get offended. <laughs> All right, everybody, we'll see you.